thank you very much, Martin and colleagues at CMCS for providing me with this opportunity to share some things from my recent research study on religious entrepreneurs, social networks and public narratives, changing perceptions in UK Christian Muslim engagement. In this seminar, I will focus on 10 British evangelicals who share a common aim to encourage other evangelicals to engage with Muslims in faithful, constructive, peaceable relationship building. I apply a novel approach to the study by considering the individuals who are envisaging change as entrepreneurs, alongside considering dynamics in the prevailing assumptions, values and practices in the faith community they are seeking to influence. I do this by building up a picture of a number of aspects of the social context, each introduced with a brief description of the rationale behind its inclusion, followed by an illustration of how it can be studied. Um, after the presentation, uh, I hope that we can use the discussion time to explore the practical implications together of these conceptual ideas. I argue that examining innovative developments within the field of Christian Muslim engagement through, the, through looking for religious entrepreneurial activity yields valuable new insights for practical implications. In addition to focusing on the activities of these individuals, I highlight some aspects of their networks of relationships and then briefly set this within a context of wider public narratives that are found in society and Christian communities more widely. These aspects provide the backdrop to the next section, which focuses on changing perspectives, factors motivating the entrepreneurs and perceptions of whom, whom within a faith community community holds legitimacy to influence wider change. I finish up with briefly considering strategies legitimizing change at a congregational level. Religious entrepreneurs. So what do I mean by religious entrepreneurs? Well, we're all familiar with the concept of entrepreneur in the context of business technology and wealth creation. Entrepreneur Entrepreneurship is usually associated with the founding of a new venture, is distinctive compared to business or management in general, and incorporates the focal role of either an individual or a small group. Entrepreneurial activity differs from the creation and innovation of something by including the recognized value to others of the innovation. A challenge is that sometimes the value may not be recognized by others until years afterwards. I will be using the terms entrepreneur, entrepreneurial activity and entrepreneurship interchangeably, although entrepreneurship uh, recognizes that the attributes may be the result of a number of people's contributions rather than that of a single entrepreneur. There are innumerable definitions of entrepreneurship to be found across popular and scholarly publications. However, it can be defined as combining resources in novel ways so as to create something of value. Over the years, the topic of entrepreneurship has expanded, so that there is a range of different kinds of entrepreneurship. These include cultural entrepreneurship, social entrepreneurship, and more recently, religious entrepreneurship. In some regards, religious entrepreneurship can be viewed as a branch of social entrepreneurship and draw on relevant scholarship from this. While a focus on economic value has remained within the study of all these different types of entrepreneurship, in each stream, there have also been those who have argued that value can be interpreted as social value, cultural value, or religious value, respectively as distinct from economic value. And I apply the term religious entrepreneurship to consider the creation of something of religious and not economic value. I argue that applying this approach enables us to draw on concepts and methods which while unfamiliar in the field of Christian Muslim engagement or religious studies more widely, nevertheless are illuminating and helpful to enable 
to enhance the practical value of new initiatives which aim to increase our understandings, perceptions of each other and interactions with each other in Christian Muslim engagement. A significant volume of work followed the seminal work by Berger and Luckman in 1966 on the construction of social reality and by Foucault on the processes through which it occurs, leading to a current interest in social symbolic objects. Some of the thinking I'm drawing on is taken from applying this to organizational fields and entrepreneurship and described as social symbolic work. Two authors, Lawrence and Phillips, proposed the following stages of social symbolic work to inspire and guide the development of new offerings. They were enactment, abstraction, translation and inversion. And they argued that applying these stages can provide insights, inspiration and guidance to actors engaged in practical concerns. As an aside, two important aspects that are fundamental to this conceptualization are that actors have agency, and I pick up on that in terms of legitimacy later on, and that opportunities for innovation can be capitalized on through the development of appropriate strategies, and I pick up on that a little bit later as well. So looking at their um, terms that they used and actually what they meant by each of them. For enactment, they described this as recognizing there is an opportunity to produce novel, valuable combinations of resources. For abstraction, they defined this as constructing an idea or concept based on concrete activities and experiences that represents a valuable resource that can be exploited by the entrepreneur. For translation, they described it as recognizing in some other context a potentially valuable practice, object or service and bringing it into a new context in which it was previously unavailable. And for inversion, the appropriation and reshaping of meaning so that the innovation has a completely different meaning or use, which may be commercial or ideological. And these four stages may be overlapping. Um, I want to draw your attention to the repeating use of the concept of valuable uh, in terms of what was being constructed. And I applied these uh, four stages. I looked for these um, in, uh, in my study. So I didn't indicate to the participants that I was looking for these stages or even particularly highlight to them that I had an interest in entrepreneurial activity. But I, I then examined their responses to a range of questions to look for descriptions of activities that encompass these stages. And I identified from their descriptions three different categories, which I considered to be potentially entrepreneurial activities. These were the creation of publications, teaching materials and courses, which aimed to change Christians' attitudes towards Muslims. Secondly, the fostering of opportunities for evangelicals and Muslims to dialogue in person about their respective faith. And thirdly, the purposeful decision to live out their faith in a Muslim majority context in the absence of being having a formal role in a church or a parachurch organization. And just a reminder that entrepreneurship and entrepreneurial activity is different from innovation by uh, being deemed to have created something of value uh, that's recognized by others. So assessing the value turned out to be very challenging. Uh, looking at the categories, the first may have been measurable in terms of both economic value as well as religious social value, but the second two 
can only be assessed in terms of their religious social value. Key points I want to draw out at this point are um, coming back to the difference between innovation and entrepreneurship to consider the question of whether the innovation is perceived to be valuable by the community it's intended for. I had considered the participants to be entrepreneurial because I myself had already been aware of them and their innovations, and this was why I'd included them in the study. Participants didn't, however, give a prominent place to the value to others of their innovations in their descriptions to me. With some, they described entrepreneurial activity, but without enough detail for me to ascertain how closely they personally had been involved in the stages. Even where it would have seemed relatively straightforward to ascertain, as in the case of one of the publications, and where I specifically probed for it by asking what number of copies had been sold. Interestingly, the participant told me they had no idea. The aspect of the recognition by a wider audience of something valuable having been created leads us on to an aspect of considerable significance in religious entrepreneurship, that of the values, beliefs, and accepted norms in the social context in which the innovation is being introduced, impact how the entrepreneurial activity is perceived and received. And I will now move on to consider some of the dynamics which may be influencing these religious innovators or entrepreneurs arising from their situatedness within organizations, including churches, parachurch organizations, formal and informal networks, of these organizations and of those organizations sitting within wider fields. Oh. Social networks. Studying the network of relationships which individuals have within the context of being members of organizations which sit in wider fields is something that falls within the significant academic field of social network analysis. Relationships between individuals can be analyzed to show a range of different um, relationships uh, and angles. For example, who within a group has access to influence, power and or resources and who doesn't. The size and density of a network of relationships, different kinds of relationships between members of the network. Sophisticated software has been developed in academia, which is capable of complex analyses of relationships. I carried out very simple social network analysis to look at the relationships between my study participants and others. But even so, it yielded some fascinating results. I was interested to know how participants were using the networks of relationships in developing and promulgating their vision. One use of social network analysis is to map the relational pathways involving friends, collaborators, and mentors. So the practical application of so social network analysis in my study was that I asked participants to name other individuals whom they considered to be mentors, collaborators, or friends in sharing their vision. And I also asked whom they recommended should be included in my research. The participants were confidential, which meant that to my, to my knowledge, they did not know who else I had invited to take part. This slide is a plot of the relational flow between study participants in which the arrows point from the participant I questioned to another participant who was in the study. You'll see that some participants mentioned each other as collaborators, mentors and friends. Some descriptors of mentors, collaborators or friends were not mutual and some study participants didn't mention any other study participants. Participant four was well accepted as a friend, collaborator and mentor by half the participants. Participant 10 in contrast sits outside the group giving no mentions to and receiving no mentions from other participants. 
I will comment on this in a moment. However, I just want to show you the next slide, which has a table listing other individuals whom participants also identified as mentors, collaborators or friends and or recommended for interview. So here you can see that individuals F and B, uh, none of these um, individuals uh, um, described by the letters uh, were participants, um, were identified as collaborators, mentors or friends by a greater number of participants than were several of the participants whom I uh, interviewed and identifies others whom I could have included in the study. So I, just to draw out a few implications from this very quick overview and very brief investigation is that this approach raises all sorts of questions which would be valuable to pursue such as uh, obviously to do with the sampling method I used and how that plays into these findings. Things like the implications of these individuals' roles that they held uh, for their position uh, in networks of relationships, their theological perspectives, whether that affected um, their standing amongst other participants, their respective genders, their ethnicities, and the actual innovations that they were developing. Um, it brings to light a number of different aspects in considering strategies for seeking to engage a faith community with entrepreneurial activity and implications that may be important when developing and promulgating an innovation which one hopes will be valued widely in the community of interest. I want to move on now to briefly mention another topic. Uh, in terms of um, it was a, a so, sorry subject I was interested in was the role of public narratives in influencing prevailing attitudes and practices within British Christian communities. And from a personal perspective, my interest in this was, um, that the negative portrayals of M British Muslims in public narratives is the subject of a significant body of academic research, as well as a number of reports and publications. And it's a topic that Richard discussed in the first seminar of this term. And some of these reports differentiate between Christians and others. So moving on to this section where I, I want to sort of really highlight changing perspectives. And this is in order to um, uh, demonstrate or, or to enable va the value of an innovation to be recognized or factors that may be preventing it being valued in the community of interest. So, in the first part of this presentation, I've signaled the importance in entrepreneurship of the perceived value of an innovation by a wider audience. In this section, I'll be focusing on some of the social dynamics between the innovator and the faith community they are engaging with and within the faith community itself. In terms of public narratives, I asked each participant what had motivated them to engage in this envisioning work that they had created an innovative approach towards. And uh, as I've mentioned, my, um, this question was motivated by, as I've mentioned, an ongoing interest or concern about the impact of negative portrayals of Muslims in public narratives including by public figures, reputable TV channels and broadsheet newspapers. And I divided the responses into two categories, as you can see, concern with uh, wider macrocultural discourse and concern with negative attitudes within Christian community. And you'll see that there are seven out of 10 of the participants 
mentioned um, within their motivation at some point in the interview, their concern about negative attitudes in wider society and eight actually mentioned concern within uh, negative um, portrayals among Christians within the Christian community, which was something that I hadn't actually anticipated would come out. Um, there's a lot more that could be um, developed within this particular strand. I just want to uh, point out a couple of things. One is that the uh, participants had been engaged in the development of their innovative activities over a time span between them of about 40 years. And that obviously includes the time immediately post 9-11. And um, uh, also in terms of the second category, I included them when, if they mentioned only perhaps a single voice that they were aware of that was having an effect. So there's not a, a um, no, the, the sort of density and the volume of those attitudes is not, uh, investigated in this and it doesn't come out. But I've included it to highlight that narratives in wider society impact values, attitudes, beliefs, meanings and practices of Christians towards Muslims, both in terms of creating new initiatives and of how those initiatives are received. The next subject I want to look at is legitimacy. So social groups, organizations are impacted by shared logics. These are shared attitudes, values, beliefs, meanings, and practices that are developed and are maintained within an organization or a group and between organizations and groups. And this approach comes out of a large field of academic study, which is called institutional theory which I drew on in this study and was very interested in. There's many aspects that it could be applied to, um, the triggering of informal social controls within a social group when assumed meanings are challenged, the role of conflict in disrupting and or reinforcing logics, ways which individuals who belong to social groups or organizations that have differing logics find to navigate or negotiate their way through these. An aspect I was particularly interested in was that the perceived social religious value of the innovation is linked to the extent to which the innovator or entrepreneur is perceived to have legitimacy to influence the values and behaviours of the wider group. I asked about this aspect of legitimacy through a direct question about what characteristics participants perceived to convey legitimacy to promulgate their vision to other evangelicals. And this is an overview of the most popular um, aspects, attributes that were described. What was interesting to me was this question yielded a lot of surprise and for some perplexity. It wasn't a perspective that participants were used to thinking about at all. What seemed to become clear as I interviewed more participants was that not surprisingly, they identified characteristics which I perceived to be values they held dear for themselves. What came out as well was whom they perceive to be cons considered leg legitimate and to be listened to by other evangelicals. And although there was some common ground between these two categories, there was also significant differences and there was detectable frustration. Feedback highlighted that there is scope for a lot of research in this aspect, including into the perception by female participants who I have to say were significantly underrepresented in my sample of uh, participants. Um, but their, their perception 
that men were perceived to have greater legitimacy in a faith community, regardless of having experience or knowledge in a specific topic uh, under consideration. Um, top of the list, uh, as you can see, was legitimacy, which was associated with having specific religious beliefs or interpretations. Probably not surprising, but it's important to keep that in mind. Next was being personally known or recommended by trusted Christian leaders which calls up to some extent the importance of the findings of social network analysis for um, those networks of uh, mentors and collaborators and friends. Next was having a combination of knowledge about Islam and Muslim combined with lived experience of living and working with Muslims in a social or political context in any country or UK city. Um, and I've included the last category of perception that recipients of the vision uh, valued experience of Christians uh, who were relating to Muslims at grassroots level, um, just because, interestingly, it came up in the context of who recipients valued, but not in the context wasn't named as um, by participants as uh, a value, an attribute uh, of entrepreneurs. I, I think within this, there, the findings hint that there may be different perspectives on this aspect of legitimacy between leaders and lay people. And there's a lot that could be unearthed about leadership uh, and legitimacy and the ramifications of that in Christian Muslim relations. So just to pause and sum up so far, I have made a case that innovation within a social context and social implications can be considered to be entrepreneurial. It can be useful to look for four stages in its development, which can help in the development of strategies and processes to launch the innovation. However, by definition, it will only be entrepreneurial if it's valued by a wider audience. That takes it from being an innovation to being an entrepreneurial activity. With social and religious entrepreneurial innovations, the social or religious value that others assign to it is influenced by social factors such as the perceived legitimacy of the entrepreneur and how that fits with the prevailing values, norms, attitudes and beliefs in the social context into which it's introduced. These can be influenced by public narratives in society and the faith community. I've just one last uh, sort of topic to bring in for consideration, and that is, I've called it congregations. Um, I wanted, I, I was very conscious in my study of a difference between faith communities and sort of wider society being that we have these bodies, these congregations, which we belong to, um, in which we kind of submit our own personal values and beliefs and attitudes and practices to a certain extent to uh, the values of that corporate body as a an act of our kind of submission to God and our worship of him. And um, I wanted to somehow see if that uh, I could bring in some of that into thinking about Christian Muslim relations and the value of entrepreneurial activity and how it's perceived so that we weren't simply talking about 
Christians within Christian community as individuals, but also talking about them as members of these corporate identity uh, organizations that are congregations. Um, so I drew from what I thought was a fascinating study of the eco-faith movement in the US, which is described by Biscotti and Bigart, where they identified four strategies, which they described as strategic acts of legitimation at the level of the congregation in the sort of rolling out of the eco-faith movement and encouraging behavior change. So it, it includes strategies for changing behavior uh, in eco terms at a congregational level. And they had identified four different um, uh, uh, categories which I've put on slide uh, to do with the um, ingraining uh, the requirement to do this in scriptural texts and also linking it to social justice in some way. The personal use of stories of God's presence and activity, success stories of Christian congregations, or well, it wasn't simply Christian congregations in their case, but I, I was only looking at Christian congregations, of changing behaviour as a congregation and the use within a congregation of rituals and symbols. And I just tried, I, I just a little bit looked for some of this within the responses given to me by participants and categorized what I found. Um, and one of the things that um, uh, really came out to me was um, that I noticed some sort of corporate community, uh, some sort of church community corporate change uh, being talked about particularly where it was being talked about that I could see was uh, in the context of the Church of England, and I hadn't asked participants what denomination or network of churches they uh, were part of. Um, but um, two things came out. One was um, Church of England clergy um, uh, having this vision, which was related to the, the, the church being concept of the cure of souls within a parish, but that they uh, received a mixed reception in terms of whether the congregations as, as a, a community were willing to change or not. And then the other was that um, where a senior role in the Church of England was committed to this type of engagement and stayed in post for a significant period of time, a lot of change within their local diocese appeared to be enabled, which spread beyond the remit and influence of the Church of England. So I'm just uh, at the end of my presentation uh, in the sort of summing up stages. Um, I've looked at religious entrepreneurship, the implications of social networks or raised that I believe they have implications in, social, in religious entrepreneurship. Public narratives impact uh, both what is motivated and how it's received. And there's a whole angle of changing perceptions uh, in order to recognize value um, which has links with the motivation of the entrepreneurs with their legitimacy or not, and can be implemented at congregational level, not simply targeted at individuals. And I've done a schematic to try and bring this all together where I've got at the center, you'll see the perceived value of an innovation and the context in which it's launched being the prevailing values, attitudes, beliefs, 
informal social, social rules and behavioral norms across the faith community. And then identifying how faith communities perceive legitimacy, uh, being kind of in a dynamic flex with that, having again, uh, an impact and impacting networks, relationships across faith, looking at um, popular narratives in uh, the public space, both the wider public space and the faith community and how they uh, may influence prevailing values, attitudes, beliefs, informal social rules and behavioral norms in the faith community. And then differentiating out from that actually the specific identity of a local congregation and the prevailing values, attitudes, beliefs, and informal social rules and behavioral norms that may be different to those of an individual who is a member of that congregation and the interaction and negotiation that has to happen through those. So that's the end of my presentation. And I now hope that in moving into the discussion time that um, we'll be able to explore uh, what you think about it and whether there, how it might uh, impact the development of innovative and new approaches to Christian Muslim engagement and how they're received within our faith communities. Thank you.